Police in Baghdad are investigating the city's second bank robbery in just a week. The robber stole $7 million in a deadly early morning heist. January 13th, 2006, five bandits flawlessly executed a bank robbery using fake guns in underground tunnels. The robbery was perfect as they stole 20 million without leaving any traces. However, one greedy act foiled the entire plan, changing the course of their lives forever. Here are some of the smartest robberies in history. The Great Buenos Aires Bank Heist now this might just be the closest you'll ever get to experience the Netflix original Money Heist in real life. Dubbed the heist of the century, the great Buenos Aires bank robbery in Argentina has left investigators and governments alike puzzled by its technicality and flawless execution. However, the downfall of this impeccable heist came when the wife of one bandit exposed the entire team. In 2006, an army of police officers surrounded the Banco Rio in Acasuso, Argentina and negotiated for hours with a bold group of robbers inside. The criminals took hostages and demanded the police bring them pizza, as the nation watched on live TV. Snipers perched in trees, military battalions staged outside, ready to shoot if needed. And then one robber told the police that they were ready to surrender. But when law enforcement entered the bank, the thieves had vanished without a trace. Taken with them a reported $20 million in cash and valuables from safety deposit boxes. The mastermind behind this heist was a man named Fernando Arajo. In 2003, Arajo began planning this phase by renting a house near the bank and exploring the sewage tunnels below. Taking inspiration from the cartoon franchise Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, he named this heist the Donatello Project. Posing as an architectural student, he called the Public Works Agency in Akasuso to get information on the stats of those tunnels. Then he convinced Sebastian Garcia Bolster, a local motorcycle mechanic, to join his team as a civil engineer. They calculated how to drill 15 meters diagonally into the bank, essentially making their tunnel a triangular hypotenuse between the building's basement and the sewer. And as their plans came together, they would find more men to be part of this heist. And after years of planning, they decided that instead of escaping through the sewers, as law enforcement would suspect, they would go deeper into the city's bowels. At around 12.38 p.m. on January 13, 2006, the team of robbers stormed through the front door of the bank, guns in hand and ready to take hostages. Arajo and his men gathered everyone together and forced the manager to open the bank's vaults. Police quickly descended upon the bank, while one of these thieves made fake negotiations in a bid to buy his men time. After two hours, they cracked open 143 safe boxes, and it was time to escape. Sayanis, the man doing the negotiations, then told authorities that they were ready to surrender. He instructed them to bring some boxes of pizza and a soda, so they could have a little meal before surrendering. This was all part of the plan to get out of the bank before the cops could get in. They splashed chlorine all over the place to cover DNA traces and tossed around random strands of hair to throw off CSI. Then they escaped into the tunnels they built and then into the sewer without a trace. But here's where our story takes a huge turn. Once inside the sewers, they had stationed two small boats that would drive them miles away to another location where they had stationed their getaway van. The crew had bought an old van and customized it to have a floor hatch so that they could park it above a manhole and climb directly into the vehicle without ever going out onto the street. It was pretty smart. And once they got into this van, they successfully drove to their safe house, shared the money, and parted ways. This was a picture-perfect job. The take was massive. The police had no leads. And above all, the guns they used were fake. Arako and his team seemed to have gotten away with the robbery while enjoying their riches in peace. But that was far from the reality. One of the robbers named Beto had a wife, Alicia de Tuyo, who began stealing from him. On one occasion, she took over $300,000 from his stash without telling him. Now, these two had been together for 18 years, but in that moment, none of that mattered. Beto got angry and wanted his money back. However, an angry Alicia decided to call the cops and snitch on her husband. The crazy part here is that Beto wasn't even a crucial member of the team. He was only brought in as extra muscle, but unfortunately for them, his collapsing marriage thwarted everyone's freedom. All members of the team, Beto, Olstead, Sayanes, Arajo, 
and Zayo Echeverria were arrested and charged, with Alicia de Tuyo serving as a confidential witness. In 2010, Beto was sentenced to 15 years, Araujo was given 14, Zayo Echeverria got 10, and Bolster got 9. Sayanis agreed to a separate expedited trial, where he was given 14 years for not just the robbery, but other miscellaneous crimes he was found connected to at around that time as well. None of these men ended up serving their full sentences, and by the time they got out, they were celebrated for pulling off such a fantastic heist. Netflix even made a documentary about it. Now, no one really knows if the funds were ever recovered, but according to Araujo, everyone had a happy ending. The 2013 Carlton Cons Heist the glamorous Carlton Hotel on the French Riviera is a favorite haunt of the rich and fabulously famous, which makes it a good place to exhibit diamonds, and turns out not a bad place to steal them either. This 2013 brazen jewelry theft happened at the Carlton Cons Hotel in Paris, the same hotel that was used as the setting for a movie about a brazen jewelry theft. Around noon on July 28, 2013, the terrace doors of the opulent intercontinental Carlton Cons Hotel on the French Riviera was supposed to be locked. But before lunchtime, a thief, whose face was covered with a bandana and a motorcycle helmet, managed to slip through those closed doors, making his way directly into the exhibition room loaded with millions of dollars worth of Lviv diamonds. The world's most extraordinary. Armed with an automatic pistol and a very weird familiarity with this room, he pulled off arguably the smartest and biggest robbery in Europe. You see, here's the thing. This robber wasn't really confronted with an intimidating scenario, and that's because the exhibit hadn't yet opened. No hotel guests or customers were moving around. In fact, this thief had arrived at exactly the most opportune moment, just before the high-profile jewels were to be loaded into secure display cases. This was just too well planned. However, he did have to contend with a small group that had gathered in the room. Two vendors, a show manager, and three unarmed private security guards. But the threat of the firearm he held was enough to hold him off. They watched as he seized a briefcase and box full of jewels belonging to Israeli diamond and real estate billionaire Lev Lviv. This box contained 72 pieces of jewelry, 34 of which were considered exceptional because of the gem's unblemished clarity, brilliant color, and large carat weight along with the intricate cuts and polishes by master craftsmen. And once the robber had everything he wanted, he made another brilliant getaway through a side door that led to a multitude of people strolling around the vicinity with no one to stop him. After authorities were called to the scene, investigators revealed that he made away with gems valued at $103 million. It was the largest value jewel theft in French history, and one of the biggest in the world. Shockingly, all it took was some brute force in about 60 seconds to do so. The heist also occurred in the same hotel where film director Alfred Hitchcock shot much of his classic 1955 romance thriller, To Catch a Thief. Is it just a coincidence or did the movie propel the bandit to recreate the scenes in real life? Regardless of the answer, French police later released footage from inside the exhibition room, showing the heist happening in real time. But even with that, the heist was so clean that they couldn't find any leads to pursue the bandit. His identity and that of his potential accomplices are still unknown, but theories about a link to the jewel-snatching syndicate the Pink Panthers, an organized crime group with hundreds of members and roots in former Yugoslavia, began surfacing in the press almost immediately after the heist. But regardless of the perpetrator's identity, the heist was no doubt the work of a professional. That's a classic way of getting away with it. Lend into the crowd. It's a brilliant piece of, uh, of utterly simplistic, easy robbery. The Antwerp Diamond Heist. Comparable to the Carlton Cons heist, the Antwerp Diamond robbery occurred in a similar fashion but on a grander scale. February 17, 2003, Antwerp Police, responsible for supervising the Diamond neighborhood and its businesses in Belgium, got a call that a heist had taken place at the Antwerp Diamond Center. The vault was empty, and diamonds worth over $100 million were estimated to have been stolen. As crazy as that sounds, this heist really made no sense. As a matter of fact, it was almost impossible for this to have happened. The vault the diamonds were sitting in was protected by multiple security mechanisms including a lock with a hundred million possible combinations, infrared heat detectors, a seismic sensor, 
Doppler radar, and a magnetic field. The building itself had a private security force and was located in the heavily guarded and monitored Antwerp Diamond District. So how exactly did these guys pull it off? Well, the answer revolves around two words. Leonardo Notar Bartolo. Leonardo was the guy behind this grand heist. Months prior to its execution, he rented an apartment in the Antwerp World Diamond Center to draft out this plan. He employed the help of five other men while going ahead to plant a surveillance camera at the top of the vault. The thieves checked the footage from the camera to learn the security code used by the guards to gain access. They did this for months, studying how the guards took shifts and the possible time window they could take advantage of to carry out the heist. Now, The day before the execution, Leonardo visited the vault with a few guards. And without them noticing, he sprayed hairspray on the thermal sensors to temporarily disable them. Now, To avoid the large number of security cameras in the area, one of the thieves, known as the King of Keys, picked the lock of an abandoned office building that adjoined the Diamond Center as they both shared a garden that wasn't under video surveillance. On the day of the heist, it seemed like a scene straight out of a Hollywood blockbuster film. They broke into this thing by disabling the magnetic locks and slipping past the heat sensors by cleverly using styrofoam boxes and taping over the light sensors to avoid detection. Their plan was perfect, and they made away with the treasures of this vault. However, as smart as that was, they were dumb enough to openly dispose of evidence of their plans in a public bin. Now, This trash was ransacked by the police after an unsuspecting neighbor of Leonardo heard of the robbery and informed the cops of some useful evidence seen in their apartment's trash can. When apprehended, Notar Bartolo refused to name his accomplices and consequently, he was given 10 years in prison for the crime, though he served only half of that. In 2013, he was arrested again for breach of his parole as he made no effort to compensate those he had stolen from. He was forced to serve out the remainder of his sentence and was finally released in 2017. Three other men, Pietro Tavano, Ferdinando Finotto, and Elio Donorio, were sentenced to five years in prison. One man, known only by his alias, the King of Keys, was never identified by police. And of course, the diamonds were never retrieved. The Societe Generale Bank Heist In the 1970s, a man named Albert Spaghiati single-handedly orchestrated a mind-blowing bank robbery in France. However, it wasn't just the robbery that the French government was concerned with. It was how Albert orchestrated it that left him captivated. The bank we're talking about here is the Societe Generale Bank, located in the city of Nice, France. This is a French-based multinational financial services company, ranking as the third largest bank by total assets in France and the sixth in Europe. That alone illustrates the immense scale of this bank, and anyone stupid enough to contemplate a robbery was either utterly mad or signing a death wish. But Spaghiari here wasn't mad nor seeking to get himself killed. He was simply a genius. Born on December 14, 1932, Spaggiari grew up in Laragne Monteglan, where he lived the early part of his life with his parents. At 19, he enlisted as a paratrooper in the First Indochina War and was posted to the 3rd Battalion Colonial Paratroopers. During that time, he and a few accomplices put a gun to the head of someone they claimed had robbed him. The military court, however, believed that this was actually a stick-up, and Spaggiati would spend the next four years in jail. Following his release, he moved to North Africa and joined the Secret Armed Organization, also known as the OAS, a right-wing group preventing Algerian independence. Now, this again landed him in prison for the next three and a half years. Before that, though, Spaghiati met his wife, Aldi, and the two would get married before his incarceration. And upon his release, they moved to France to start life afresh. But what they didn't know was that the worst was yet to come. Spaghiati got information about new sewers being built close to this bank, and somewhere in his mind he decided to pull off this massive heist. He began to plan a break-in, and eventually decided that he'd be digging into the bank vault from below. To do this, he needed a solid plan, so he opened a safe deposit box within that bank to get a closer look at the mechanics of the bank's vault. He discovered that the doors were considered impenetrable because they were extremely thick and there was no obvious way to access the other walls from inside. Spaghiati reached out to professional gangsters from Marseille, but after they reviewed his plans and surveyed the site, they chose not to join him in this heist due to the high level of risk. 
Not one to give up, Albert contacted old friends from the OAS, who provided him with men crazy enough to join this plan. These men would make their way into the sewers and spend two months digging an eight-meter-long tunnel from the sewer to the vault. Albert had to take precautions during this dig while his men worked long hours continuously drilling. He told them not to drink coffee or alcohol and to get at least 10 hours of sleep every shift to avoid endangering the operation. July 16, 1976, during the long weekend of Bastille Day, Albert's gang broke into this bank vault from below. Authorities couldn't ascertain how much they stole in particular, but it was estimated to be around 30 to 100 million francs worth of money, tradable assets, and other valuables. The heist was so effortless that Spaghetti and his men reportedly had a picnic inside that vault, having a meal of wine and pate. And even more shocking was the fact that they spent the whole weekend inside there. But before they exited, they left this daring message on the walls of the vault. As you can tell, I don't speak French, but Sans army, ni violence. Which translates to without weapons, neither hatred nor violence. Unfortunately, the violence was only just beginning. The French police were initially puzzled by how easily this heist was carried out. But after a few months, they were getting closer to apprehending those involved. Acting on a tip from a former girlfriend, they arrested one of the thieves. This led to the arrest of the whole gang, including Spaghetti. Now at first, Albert denied his involvement in the break-in, and then he acknowledged it but claimed that he was working to fund a secret political organization. When he realized that the court wasn't buying any of that, he devised an escape plan, true to his nature. During his case hearing, Spaghetti made a fictitious document which he claimed to be evidence of his innocence. He coded the document in a way that only the judge could decipher. So while Judge Richard Boaziz was distracted by this document, Spaghetti jumped out of the court window, landing safely on a parked car, and escaped on a waiting motorcycle. Awesome! We only get to see this in movies, but this actually happened. This man once again proved to be smarter than the French authorities. He lived the remainder of his days in hiding, after undergoing plastic surgery, relocating to Argentina, and even releasing a book on how he planned the heist. However, on June 10, 1989, Spaghetti was said to have died under mysterious circumstances, and the proceeds from the heist were never found. The 2009 Graf Diamonds Robbery This was the moment two men dressed in suits and disguised with professional makeup made their way into the Graf Diamond store in New Bond Street, London. In less than three minutes, they left that building with $65 million worth of diamonds, and it all occurred in broad daylight. Now, the robbers enlisted the services of a professional makeup artist to alter their skin tones and their features using latex prosthetics fitted with professional wigs. The artist took four hours to apply these disguises. Having been told that it was for a music video, the makeup was so good that one of the robbers said even his own mother wouldn't recognize him. And maybe he was right, but anyway. At 4.40 p.m. on August 6, 2009, these two men made their way into that store without making any effort to conceal their faces from surveillance cameras. Once inside, they forced an employee at gunpoint, Petra Enar, to empty the store's display cabinets inside their bags. A total of 43 items, including rings, bracelets, necklaces, and watches were taken. Petra was also forced into the street at gunpoint, being used for their getaway while she was held hostage. Now, she would later testify that the robbers threatened to kill her if she didn't follow their commands. And after she was released, one of the robbers fired a gunshot into the air to create confusion before they escaped in a blue BMW. Now here's where their story actually gets interesting. That getaway vehicle was abandoned nearby Dover Street, where another gunshot was fired into the ground, allowing the robbers to switch to a second vehicle, which was a silver Mercedes, and then to a third around Farm Street, London. From there, the police couldn't trace them any further. However, one of the robbers foolishly made one mistake that eventually led to their capture. In their haste to transfer between getaway cars, one of the robbers left his phone wedged in between the handbrake and the driver's seat. Come on! I mean, after all this planning and preparation, and then just carrying out arguably one of the largest gem heists in Britain, without a hitch, something as ridiculous as a cell phone would lead to the gang being caught. Anonymous numbers stored on that phone quickly led the cops to uncover the identity of the robbers. Aman Kasai, the main individual who orchestrated and carried out the heist, was found guilty of conspiracy to rob, kidnap, and possess a firearm after a three-month trial at Woolwich Crown Court. 
August 7, 2010, he was given 23 years in prison. Three other men, 25-year-old Solomon Bayin, 43-year-old Clinton Mogg, and 46-year-old Thomas Thomas were each jailed for 16 years, after also being convicted of conspiracy to rob. So what happened to those diamonds? Well, as of today, only one of the 43 pieces stolen has been recovered. In 2012, a Hong Kong pawn shop submitted a 16-karat yellow diamond for certification by the Gemological Institute of America. And indeed, the institute certified that this yellow diamond was one of those stolen during the robbery. All the diamonds in that store had been laser inscribed with the graph logo, but this can be taken off easily with a wiling stone cutter. Judging from the nature of this robbery, it became clear that these robbers were well connected. Police are convinced that the jewelry would have been flown abroad to waiting customers within hours of this robbery's execution. Kent Securitas Depot Robbery February 22, 2006, a call was received startling local law enforcement and shortly after, the entire United Kingdom. Kent police rushed to a nondescript Securitas depository near the Tunbridge Rail Station, only to find that arguably the largest bank heist in the history of the UK had just been pulled and the perpetrators gone without a trace. For context, the Bank of England printed pound sterling banknotes in Debden, Epping Forest. However, starting in 2006, the distribution of currency was outsourced to five companies, one of which was Securitas. Securitas operated centers throughout England and Wales where they stored the currency for redistribution or destruction. Now, one of these centers was found in Tunbridge, England, operating continuously, 24-7. The facility employed 80 full-time staff working in three shifts. Their primary tasks were to sort and count banknotes delivered by armored transport, which were then sent out to replenish cash machines. So, how exactly did this happen? Well, just like the others, it began with one man. But this time, that man just so happened to be the actual manager of the depository, Colin Dixon. Mr. Dixon lived in Hearn Bay with his wife and their young child. Owing to the nature of his job, he had been trained not to tell his colleagues where he lived and to drive to work every day using a different route. The family owned two cars, and he would alternate which car he used. He'd been told that if he was ever stopped by the police while driving that he should stay in his car and give the officers a piece of paper describing his job, then follow him to the nearest station where he would cooperate with their inquiries. Now, despite these specific precautions, Mr. Dixon would later be used as bait by a set of criminals looking to loot millions of pounds from the depository he managed. February 21st, 2006, Dixon was kidnapped while driving home from work by criminals dressed in fake police uniforms. His family was then called and informed that he had been involved in a car accident. They were told to come meet him at a specific hospital. But once they got there, they were also abducted and used to threaten Dixon. In turn, Dixon provided them with the full details of the depot and everything they would need to know to gain access in and out of the building. On the day of the incident, a crew of criminals charged into this building with assault rifles, submachine guns, and pump-action shotguns. Some employees were tied up inside the depository's vault, while others were forced to help load the stolen cash onto a truck. The execution was flawless given that the bandits already knew the location of every alarm and had all the key codes to the vaults. They made away with nearly a hundred million dollars in about an hour. But unfortunately for them, they didn't plan their getaway as meticulously as they should have. The following day, Securitas and their insurers offered a reward of two million pounds for any information about the heist, which report stated was the largest reward ever offered in the UK. And with that, it didn't take long before something turned up. The makeup artist who helped alter their appearance, Harvey Nichols, was identified. From there, investigators confiscated her makeup kits, allowing him to find DNA linking him to one of the criminals. This guy was a South London celebrity and MMA brawler. I'm talking about Lightning Lee Murray. Within a few hours, the robbery had several loose ends. Vehicles used in this heist, some filled with millions in banknotes, were found. Soon after, police recovered about half of the money and arrested multiple members of the heist. Most of them received sentences ranging from 15 years to life for their crimes. However, Murray, who flew out to Morocco immediately after this heist, wasn't extradited to the UK, but got a 10-year prison sentence to be served in Morocco. 
That sentence was appealed and later doubled, meaning his earliest release year is now set for 2035. Hats off to the UK authorities for their swift action. The Gardner Museum Art Heist This art was known to steal the hearts of many, and some group of people had robbed those very pieces of art right inside the Isabella Stewart Museum in Boston. But even more intriguing is that this heist lasted just 81 minutes, and over $500 million worth of art was made away with. At 1.24 a.m. on March 18, 1990, two men dressed as cops walked into Boston's Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in response to a disturbance call. However, once they got in, they subdued the guards and wrapped their head and eyes with duct tape. And without asking for directions, they led the guards into the basement where they were handcuffed to a steam pipe and workbench. The pair went on to move 13 treasured artworks on display in the lavishly decorated gallery, smashing the protective glass of the two Rembrandt paintings and cutting the canvases from their gilded frames. Two of the most important pieces here were The Storm on the Sea of Galilee, a 1633 oil-on-canvas painting by the Dutch Golden Age painter Rembrandt van Rijn, and The Concert by Dutch painter Vermeer, one of only 34 paintings attributed to him. This single painting accounts for half of the overall theft's value, estimated at $250 million as of 2015. Experts also believe that the concert may be the most valuable stolen object in the world. And to portray just how smart these guys were, they made sure to leave behind no evidence. After gathering all these paintings, they moved to the security director's office, where they took video cassettes that contained evidence of their entrance from the closed circuit cameras, as well as data printouts from the motion detecting equipment. The FBI would take control of this case on grounds that the art could cross state lines. Investigators also believed that this case was unique for its lack of strong physical evidence. It's unknown if the thieves left DNA evidence, and though finger and footprints were found at the scene, it couldn't be concluded whether they were from the thieves or from museum employees. In 2013, the FBI announced that they had identified the two thieves with a high degree of confidence. They revealed that the men involved were George Reisfelder and Leonard DiMuzio, two associates of the late mobster Carmelo Merlino. Both men resembled police sketches of the criminals. Unfortunately, they both died within one year of the heist. Investigators also suspected that the art was transported via organized crime networks to Connecticut and the Philadelphia region, where the thieves attempted to sell these works on the black market. After those attempted sales, however, they lost trail of the artwork. Till today, the art heist is still talked about all around the world, and the center topic, which no one can deny, is how simple yet professional the heist was conducted. The 2007 Dar es Salaam Bank Heist July 11, 2007, three guards at the Dar es Salaam Bank, a private financial institution in Baghdad, Iraq, carried out a robbery stealing over $280 million. Now, this robbery was so mind-blowing that the Guinness World Records called it the greatest robbery of a bank. During the Iraqi Civil War, which occurred between 2006 and 8, the Iraqi police faced severe limitations in resources and jurisdiction, resulting in no charges being brought against anyone involved in this robbery. The private bank targeted was also owned by the financial banking giants HSBC. But even with all this information, there's still a lot more lacking to that story. For one, reports confirmed after the robbery that the stolen money was in American dollars, not Iraqi dinars, making it unclear why the bank had that much money on hand in dollars, or how the robbers even managed to move such a large amount without being detected. Several officials speculated that the robbers had connections to the militias, because under normal circumstances it would have been difficult or even impossible for them to move such a volume of cash without being searched throughout the many checkpoints in Baghdad. Some analysts believe that this robbery might have been connected to corruption within the Iraqi government, mismanagement of funds by the Coalition Provisional Authority, and the influence of sectarian militias in post-invasion Iraq. But whatever the case is, the perps of this robbery were pretty smart to take advantage of the hostile situation in Baghdad and easily fill their pockets with millions of dollars. The Chow Sang Sang Robbery Wow, blank and you might miss it because this might be the fastest robbery in history, with bandits stealing $3 million worth of jewelry in just 10 seconds. September 2017, three thieves fled on a motorbike with very expensive jewelry after smashing a store window with hammers in one of Hong Kong's busiest shopping districts. 
Here's footage captured of these men committing the act and also the moment they fled on a motorcycle. The brazen smash and grab raid took just 10 seconds to execute, and in a minute they were out of the vicinity. The robbers targeted the Sim Sha Sui branch of Chow Sang Sang Jewelry on the ground floor of the Silver Cord Shopping Arcade on Canton Road. And according to reports, these guys weren't even Chinese. But here's the good part. Just a few days later, all three men in connection to the robbery had been arrested. One of them was caught 600 meters from the scene, and most of the stolen jewelry was found. Now the other two were arrested at Shenzhen Bay Port as they attempted to flee the Chinese mainland on separate cross-border buses. Apparently, all three men had entered Hong Kong on tourist visas. Conversely, a woman surnamed Wong, who was a 40-year-old cleaner, walked past the Hong Kong Heritage Discovery Center in Kowloon Park during lunchtime and found a shining diamond on a path. Wong picked up this ring thinking that it was fake and put it on her hand before going back to the office. However, while at that office, she learned about the robbery and suspected that the ring she had on was part of the one stolen. Wong then took out the ring and noticed Chow Sang Sang and 5.01 carat engraved on it. That was enough for her to report it to the Sim Sha Sui police. Eventually, it was discovered by the staff of the shop that the ring was one of nine pieces of jewelry snatched in the heist. The ring reportedly cost millions of dollars, but thanks to Wong's honesty, it was brought back. The Central Bank of Iraq Robbery 4 a.m. March 18, 2003. Three trucks pull out of the Central Bank of Iraq. Their cargo was nearly a billion dollars, a full quarter of the country's currency reserves. The loot was taken by a team led by Qasai Hussein, the son of Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. In 2003, Western media would tell us that this place was on the edge of chaos. They called Saddam a dictator, a country enduring years of oppression, economic sanctions, and international isolation. The UN and US would accuse them of owning weapons of mass destruction, never found, and tension of an invasion had reached its peak. Well, the US did invade Iraq, but just hours before this invasion began, a handwritten letter signed by Qasai Hussein himself arrived at the Central Bank of Iraq. The letter ordered the bank to release $1 billion in cash as this money was to be used for the well-being of the nation. However, we can smell the facade. The bank's employees, fearful of retribution from Saddam's regime for not complying, began loading money onto the trucks. The operation would take more than five hours to complete and included transferring nearly 900 million US dollars and 100 million in euros. This money was being stored in metal and plastic containers and the weight of the money required three tractor trailers to transport it. Kusei and his brother Uday then organized a team of loyal associates, which included officials from the Iraqi intelligence and security services. This team carried out the heist by transporting the trucks safely to their location. This might be regarded as one of the most bizarre robberies ever, due to the tactics of power and intimidation employed. With no guns or violence, Kusei robbed Iraq of billions of dollars using his authority. There was absolutely nothing anyone could do to stop him. Or was there? Kasey never got to live long enough to spend a dime from that heist, because after the US invasion, Saddam Hussein's regime crumbled, and he and his younger brother were killed in firefights with American forces. Nonetheless, the money was still missing. American agencies, including the FBI and the CIA, along with other military forces, organized a massive coordinated effort to track down and recover the missing cash. I mean, it was too much to be hidden without the knowledge of a few people, right? Well, unfortunately, only some of the cash was eventually recovered. American troops discovered $650 million in cash hidden inside the walls of one of Saddam Hussein's palaces. Additional raids on other palaces yielded more recoveries, but much of the missing cash is still unaccounted for. And maybe, just maybe, it's still out there. <laughs>